I hope your yes is for the right thing, not the fireworks. <laughs> Thank God for the sausage too. Thank God for the fireworks. I want you, if you have your Bibles, come quickly with me to the book of Genesis. Genesis is the book of beginnings. Amen. And so there are patterns in the book of Genesis that must be carried out right until the book of Revelation comes to an end. Because what God begins, he brings it to completion. The Bible talks about consummation of all things in Christ. Things in heaven, things on earth must all be pulled together in Christ. Amen. Amen. Every race, every tribe are going to be pulled together. There's not going to be many religions, but there's one. The people said, we are afraid of the one world government of the Antichrist. Do you know Jesus also wants the one world, one government too? The government is upon his shoulders. Amen. He's going to make sure that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. That he alone is God. Amen. 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 Genesis 28. Verse 1. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise and go to Padam Aram, to the house of Betuel, your mother's father. And from there take a wife to yourself, from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of people. May you also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you, that you may possess the land of your sojourning which God had, give, God had given to Abraham. Now one of the most amazing revelations God has given to us in these last days is the transfer of generational blessings. Yeah. What God has given to the grandfather came to the father, from the father to the grandson, from the grandson, it came down to Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. Bible tells us that when God spoke to Abraham, he said, in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Yeah. Within the 50 chapters of the book of Genesis, we can see that Joseph rose to become that seed. At that, at that moment of time, resembling Christ, that in Christ, all things will bow. Are you listening? Yes. Through, through, through Joseph, all the nations of the earth were blessed. Amen. And I believe there's something very important for us, especially as young people, as we see generations connect together. We can see the transfer of God's grace from one generation to another. Because God does not want to start something and let it die. He's a God who begins now and forever. Put your hands here in Genesis. Come with me to Isaiah 59. In verse 20, a redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. When we come to Zion, there is a changing of all things, a restoration of all things, the turnabout of all things, turning around of all things. Only when the church comes to the place of Zion that can we turn the table against the enemy. Not when the church is an institutional church, but when the church rises to become the un church unusual. Amen become the spiritual dimension she needs to be. And when that happens, then there is a turning around, a restoration of all things. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just an ordinary church that can turn the world around. Right. It takes a supernatural church, a church of the living God, yeah. church unusual. Yeah. Yeah. Bible tells us that Jacob went to lie, in, lie down one night in a place called Bethel, and he didn't know yeah. God was there. Yeah. He woke up that night and said, surely God is in this place, and I did not know. He said, this is the house of God. And the highway of heaven. Amen. The house of God is the highway of heaven. Heaven passes through. So if we are a church, heaven must be passing through our lives. Amen. Must be passing through our services. Must be passing through our meetings. Must be passing through everything that we are doing because we are the highway. Yes. Amen. And this is the house of God and the highway of heaven. Yes. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 32 that angels came and camped in that place because it's their highway. Jacob arrives after 20 years of being with Laban. He arrives with his two wives and all the children and all his resources and property. He arrives and he sees angels everywhere. 
same angels that he saw in this dream when he was lying that night at Bethel. He saw angels ascending and descending, and he saw angels camping abroad. He said, surely this is the camp of God. God camps that place. He tabernacles in that place. Heaven tabernacles in that place. The same place that Jacob saw. There was a ladder that went up to heaven. Angels ascending and descending. The Son of Man was on the other side. And you must remember, that's, that's the, the revelation God gave to Jacob concerning his house. And it's out of that revelation that, that the Bible talks about, that Jesus said, you don't be surprised that when you see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Is that right? He said, he said that to Nathaniel. You believe that? Yes. That there's going to be a trans, transaction between heaven and earth yes. through the church. Yes. Heaven and earth will begin to connect together, will pull together yes. through Jesus and his church. Yes. Consummation of all things in Christ. That's why church is not just a gathering of people. Yes. It's not just a gathering of people. It's a place where things happen. Yes. Things connect. Yes. Heaven and earth will begin to pull together in a powerful way. So we cannot do church as usual. Church is unusual. We just cannot carry on ordinary church meetings. It's not meetings. Jesus did not come to give us meetings and more meetings more abundantly. He came to give us life. And life more abundantly. He came to give us a supernatural resource of heaven. And he said to them, pray in such a way. Our Father who art in heaven. John could not teach that. John taught the disciples, his disciples how to pray. So the, some of the disciples of John had joined Jesus. He said, Jesus, can you teach us how to pray? He started, our Father who art in heaven, straight away they fall off the chair. Because nobody could call God as a Father. But now there was a supernatural dimension in that prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Amen. Thy kingdom come. We have the power to call for the kingdom of God to come into planet earth. And that's why generations must connect. I want to open this thing up for you so that you can really see that everything that God did in one generation can be brought forward. Not lost. But brought forward. You look at all the revivals that has happened. Let's look at the 500 years. What, what was established in Martin Luther. What was established in the Anabaptists, the Baptists, and all the denominational dimensions. You see that now today the church does not have what the founders had. Look at all the revivals that happened. Great things happened in the revival. And you look back now, you don't, you don't have what they had. But the Bible says the proper normal process is it should get better and better and better and better and better and better. What is the problem? The problem is the connection of generations. If what I have can be transferred to you and you take what I have and go on forward, what's going to happen? It's going to be called innovation. Alexander Graham Bell discovered the telephone. Is that right? But today the phone has become so changed. It is, a, it is almost a walking office. In the world, everything that they have taken has become better and better. They have innovated, improved, improvised, and got it better and better. Except the church. Everything has been lost. Every time we start something, we keep losing it. This has to stop. I said, next year our church must be better. Next year our church must be better. You must be better. We must progress. We cannot remain the same. Every day must be a day of change. Every day must be a day of progress. Every year our church must begin to explode to the next level. To the next level. If you remain in standard one for four years, that doesn't tell you anything. Except that is you, something is wrong. If the church is on the same level, it was. If the church, in fact, is not on the same level, it was before. Look at the church of Ephesus, look at the church of Corinth, look at the church of Philippi. But today the church is not a pale shadow of what was there. Even in the last 500 years, think of how the church, the Protestant church break free from the Catholic church. And how they were willing to pay the price. Most of the, Martin Luther was still a Catholic monk. But at least he fought this battle and the thesis was placed on the, on the walls of the church, on the doors of the church. And he came out, pulled out, started something fresh. But today the Lutheran church is just an institutional body. Yeah. Which they had produced in every generation another Luther. Yeah. Another Luther. That's, that's, that's what I believe. Yes. You must reproduce after your kind. Yes. If you are the only one, one kind, you are the kind that gets killed and nobody else is after you, then... 
What God started has come to an end. Yeah. Are you listening? I don't want to die in a place where I have not reproduced because that's the first commandment of God to, to Adam. Yeah. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, yeah. subdue, overcome, extend, expand yeah. the kingdom of God on planet earth. Whatever God has given to us, we must reproduce and produce another. There must be life begetting life. Yeah. If you're strong, you must beget strong. If you're a strong species, you must get the, another stronger species. That's called hybrid. Is that true? Even in the natural breeding world of animals, they want to have better and better stock. Even in the, in the, in, in the vegetation, in, in ag agriculture, they want to have better and better stock. Fruits, better and better stocks. I mean, you can say all kinds of things about genetic engineering, but at least there's something getting better and better. Are you hearing? Something getting better and better, more and more food available, no matter what the process, though the process may be wrong, yet the concept is right. Are you listening? The process may be wrong, but the concept is right, is to become better and better as a person, better and better in our results. Can you say amen to that? So let me, let me, let me put these things, thought patterns clear into your heart and into your mind this morning so that we take the, take two, the two sessions and establish this thought well. So that you forever in your mind, you know that generations must connect. Yes. Are you listening? Yes. That's why we don't fight the Lutherans. We don't fight the Baptists. We don't fight the Anabaptists. We don't fight the Methodists. We don't fight any one of them because they had something we all need. Without them, we cannot continue. Just, that's why Jesus said, I need to be baptized by you, John, for the fulfillment of all righteousness. I cannot go further without the first runner, second runner, and third runner. I may be the best runner Maybe the last runner, but I'm not running my race. I'm running the race that's been started. So we don't fight anybody. Are you listening? We don't fight anybody. We don't attack anybody because we don't start the race on our own. We start the, continue the race others have started. We acknowledge all that others have done. That's why I go to the Methodist church and I say, I'm also Methodist. I believe what happened, but I don't stay there. I look at the Pentecostals and I tell them, look, I, I believe what, what you believe, but I don't stay there. I'm not in 1900. This is two, 2000 over. I thank God for Azusa Street. We thank God for celebration of Azusa Street, but we are not in Azusa Street. Each one of us have Roman Son, Tagavilan, and all kinds of other streets. Every street must be a street of revival fire. If you go to Azusa Street, you don't have Azusa fire anymore. It's only a street. What's, what is the difference between that street and this street? Something happened then. It can happen in your street too. Do you believe that? It can happen in your village. It can happen in your city. It can happen everywhere because there were men who responded to God, received the Holy Spirit, and they connected heaven and earth together. And you can do the same. In your school, you can bring God down and cause heaven to begin to explode in the midst of your, of your, of your friends. The revival in, called the Tools Revival in Sarawak, Malaysia, happened in the school. They begin to pray, begin to, begin to seek God, then the Holy Spirit baptized young students. And as the young students were baptized, they began to speak in tongues. The whole classroom was shut down. Then the next classroom, next classroom, they went to greet the teacher. The teacher was filled with the Holy Ghost. Before long, village after village became affected. There was no school. All the school students were walking in, into the jungles. Walking into the jungle, sharing the word of God to the headhunters. As they walk into the jungle, their lights, fire begins to light their pathway. Like, just like candles, just begin to light everywhere. They walk right in the middle of the jungle, begin to speak to the headhunters. They say, we want to see the village chief. These are young students. 12 years old, 13 years old, 14 years old, filled with the Holy Ghost. Supernaturally affected, no fear whatsoever. When God takes over a man, God takes over. Yes. Are you listening? Yes. And those things can happen. It's not just a story, it's a reality. Yes. Somebody must know how to open it. Amen? Yes. Let's say, for example, I go to the tap and I turn on the tap. A young kid, a baby, two years old, goes to the tap and turns on the tap. Will the baby get the same result? Yes. All right. You're an adult, 40 years of age, you turn on the tap, the water will come forth. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Moses, two years old, he gets to the tap and he turns on the tap. You expect water or not? Yes. Do you expect water? Yes. God is not a respecter of persons. Yes. 
He's not respecter of age. What he can do one through one, he can do through others. Because it's the same process. You, if you touch the same frequency, it will just break out. That's why revivals can break out anywhere. It doesn't have to be because you're qualified in a Bible school. It doesn't have to be because you, are doing, you, you know this and you don't know that. Even if you don't know all the revelations in the Bible, if you touch the tap and turn it on by, by some way and some form, it will happen. I remember when Joanne was young, we had a cassette recorders. You know, cassette tapes. You have cassette tapes in those days. Now you have CD players, you have MP3, MP4, but we used to have. So she would crawl along and she will hit the button. And suddenly the, the eject button is hit and the eject button opens up the, the compartment of where the cassette is. You can see the excitement. You take her away, she goes in, she knocks, 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 knocks. And at some point she hits the eject button and the thing opens. You can see the excitement. Hey, it happens again. If an adult 43 years of age press the eject button, the eject button will o- open up the compartment. If a baby touches that, it will also open. Yeah. That's why God is not a respecter. If you know where to touch, things will happen. Yeah. That's why you must not be afraid that in your generation, you cannot bring revival. You can bring revival. You can bring the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. You just got to touch what others touch. What works. You just major on what works. Touch, keep touching that. Keep touching that. Keep touching that. Keep hitting that. Your schools will change. Your families will change. Your, your parents will change. Your parents will sit up and take notice of what God is doing through your life. Why? Because somewhere along the line, God has guided your hands to touch the right thing. Are you looking to say the right thing, to, to, to proclaim the right thing, and things will begin to happen. Can you say amen to that? Do you believe this? Do you believe you will make the difference? Not because of pride, but because God is a God who sovereignly works by process. Are you listening? He does the same thing through, through, the, through different men, but it's the same way. At some point, the way he de- called Moses, the way he called Abraham, he called us, is going to be the same way. All right, Every one of them have to remove their shoes and acknowledge him. Is that true? Yes. Write some important statements down, and then I'm going to show you how the connections of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph are established in the Bible. Are you ready? Number one, each generation is crucial. It is strategic in God's plan. Each generation is crucial. It is strategic in God's plan. Each generation is important. Every one of them has something to contribute. It is strategic in God's plan. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of them are important. They're unique in their own ways. Each one of them met God differently and meaningfully. Is that right? Each one's experienced the kingdom of God, his rule, his sovereignty, his favor. Each one received specific revelations. Each one was different. And that's why they were important. Each one must enter their own destiny. Each one receives special privileges of God through God encounter. Is that true? Sorry, I'm going a bit fast because we have a lot of things to do today. All right, you have the CDs, you have the MP3s, you have the DVDs. Catch up because students need to do homework. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. You don't expect me to wait at your pace. I just want to cover as much as possible so that you can understand that the power of the Holy Ghost is in each generation. Each generation is crucial. Yeah. Amen. Each generation is crucial. We are all strategically important in God. I have a contribution to make. I'm the first runner. I have a contribution to make. Second runner, you have a contribution to make. The third runner had a contribution to make. The last runner has to make up for all the loss and win this race. Everything that is lacking in the first runner, second runner, third runner is compounded pressure on the last runner. Because if the first runner did not run well, the second runner is pressure. And the second runner is, doesn't run well, the third runner is pressure to keep, make, make up for all the lost time. And the lost, lost distance. Yes. The fourth runner will have to do everything within his means to embrace all the lack of others. And rise above it. And pull master strength beyond himself. In order to live the shortcomings of other generation and overcome that shortcoming and still win the race. Yes. And we are part of the last runners. I said we are the last runners that will pull down the curtains for the Lord Jesus to return. So somewhere along the line, we must master strength from 
within our spirit to take an extra mile, to take an extra dimension of energy to go forward. So each generation is unique. So I, when I study the Bible, when I study the lives of men, I thank God for all of them in their day, in their time, because we are not running our own race, we are continuing, but they were important. That's why I study history. That's why we study all the different dimensions of truth. The, 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 you know, the Lutheran movement, the Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement. Every one of them contributed their portion. But in the last day, we've got to take everything that is there, that is good, and everything that is lacking must be given over so that we can finish the race. We don't attack them. Are you listening? This, this is not competition. We are winning this, running this race together. What they contributed to us is important. Amen. The ju justification by faith. The just shall live by faith. And that is important truth. But just it's only half a verse. Are you listening? It's a concept that needs to be lived. The life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and died for me. We have to embrace that. But that's not the end. Are you listening? That's not the end. That's just the beginning. But we've got to continue to level two. Then we continue to level three. Continue to level four. Because we haven't finished schooling yet. Are you listening? Yeah. And after we finish schooling, we come to real life. Yeah. That's another phase of life altogether. Are we hearing? Yeah. So each generation is crucial. Say after me, each generation, each generation is, crucial. is crucial. It's strategic, it's strategic. In, God's in God's plan. All right. Every one of us are important. Even in the church, each one of us are crucial. Each one of us are essential. Each one of us are strategic in God's plan. What you can do, I cannot do. What I can do, you cannot do. But we need each other. Yes. Are you listening? We need each other. The skills you have, I don't have. But what, but what I have, you don't have. So we share. Yes. So that in the sharing, the equality is established. Yes. Yes. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Please listen, I'm not talking to you like a youth conference. This is not ordinary youth conference. I'm talking to the leaders of tomorrow. Yes. I expect you one day to stand in the front and be preaching and I'll be listening down, taking down notes. I expect you to do that. I expect you to say, that, that was my student, but he's now the prime minister. I expect to do that. I expect you to rise that day so that you can give, make us proud on our, all the sacrifices we make today. Why? Because we are investing the best seed that we have into your hand, into your lives. Second Corinthians chapter 8. I'm, I'm already excited. Just, just the thought of you being a prime minister excites me. The thought of you being a millionaire, the thought of you being somebody who's going to be significant and changing the world excites me. I'm just waiting for the day that I can sit on my rocking chair and say, that's my student, that's my student, that's my student. Hallelujah. With a, with a, with a cup of mocha in my hands and rocking myself on the mountains of Switzerland for retirement. <laughs> All men do have dreams. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13. For this is not for the ease of others but for your, uh, and, for, and for your affliction, but by way of equality at this present time, your abundance is being a supply for their need, so that their abundance may also become a supply for your need. Then there may be equality. At this moment when I have, what do I do? I share with you everything that I have to you. That's not a burden. That is sharing. So that in the time when you have abundance, it comes back to me also. And the cycle is complete by way of equality. Amen. In the world, there is no equality. There is inequality. That means the rich have become more rich. The poor become poorer. The gap becomes wider and wider. But that's not how it happens in the kingdom. In the kingdom of God, when we have, we supply to those who don't have. At a time when all their needs are met, we thank God for it. But in the time of our need, they rise to the occasion and supply to our need. In the body of Christ, there is this kind of mutual reciprocal kind of response. But in the world, they take and take and take and take and take and finally kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Are you listening? The government cannot tax anybody except the rich. If, you don't, if you're poor, you don't get taxed. And the poor all never pay tax. Only the rich pay tax. So when the government wants money, they tax more, they tax more, they tax more. They're taxing who? They're taxing the one who is laying the golden egg. Before long, they steal the egg and kill the goose. And then there's no more egg anymore. And then they've got to find other ways. Governments 
basic revenue and income comes by taxing. But that's not the way to do things. Can I, can I give it to you? Let's just digress for one minute. Just one minute. I just want, want to bring this holy sacred cow down. Sacred cows make the best burger. Whether you're capitalist or socialist or communist, they have to listen to God's word. The book of Ecclesiastes, that's why the communists try to emulate what happened in the book of Acts and fail. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. In verse 8 and verse 9. I'll leave verse 8 for the business congress. But I can quietly share with you verse 9. After after all, let's read verse 8 first. If you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be sure at the sight. For one official watches over another official and there are higher officials over them. That's the hierarchy within the government office. One above the other. Corruption goes all the way. Are you listening? This is called the administration of the government. But look at verse 9. It's very interesting. After all, a king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. Are you listening? Have you got that? The king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. That means to say his provision don't come from the people. He has his own. Are you listening? Good morning, are you listening? Don't close your eyes because you won't be listening after that. All right? A king who cultivates the land is an advantage to the land. If he cultivates a field, that means he has his own source of income. He, he, king, doesn't have to live on the people. He lives on his own land. That means if the government has a way of refinancing themselves, coming to a place where they can have resources, then they really don't have to tax the people. Even God only required 10%. But government 30, 40, 50, sometimes they kill you by 60. Are you listening? Even the God, the kingdom of heaven, just barely survives on 10%. That's just for honor. Are we hearing? So at some point, the systems of this world does not work justice. The poor will become poorer. The rich will become richer. Because they will have a way of how to evade, avoid taxes. Are you listening? Yeah. So it's important. There, there must be a king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. To, if the government can find a way how they can multiply their own resources, they don't have to tax the people heavily, but allow a lot more greater freedom. In the same way, the church must be this way too. The church people must be in a way that they are, they are not taxing on the church so that whatever service we serve, we are not charging every, every service that we are serving so that the kingdom of God can be resourced, you, out of your own finances. This is what we are, we are training. We, we are training our youth to have their own jobs, their own en, en, enterprise. They have their own businesses so that at any moment, any time, I can call on them. They can just shut down their business for a week and come and join us and become part and parcel of the, of the, of the service. Sometimes if you work for others, it's impossible. You have to take leave. But if it's your job, you can plan. If it's your business, you can plan. And so thereby we provide our service free of charge. Why? Because that's our tribute to God. Is that important? I said, is that important? So each generation must change. The way we, we think must change. Each generation is crucial. It's strategic to God's plan, in God's plan. Right down number two, each generation rises out of a spiritual vacuum and prove God that is, God is real. Each generation rises out of spiritual vacuum but prove that God is real. Each generation rises out of spiritual vacuum but prove that God is real. Each generation rises out of spiritual vacuum, but prove that God is real. One of the most amazing things about generations is that each one of them are given a special terrain. 
Are you listening? They're put under special circumstances. They face certain kind of perversity. They get attacked in a certain manner. They get challenged in a certain manner. But in the midst of all of that, they rise. If they don't rise, that generation becomes destroyed. Are you listening? That's why we must not only be safe from sin, but also the perversity that happens in our generation. But when we rise above it, then we become a generation that can serve our generation well. Are we hearing? If you face the same problem all your friends face, then you're not the answer. They backslide, you backslide. They run away, you run away. You, they, they go out with non-Christian girlfriends. You go out with non-Christian girlfriends. They smoke, you smoke. They drink, you drink. How are you ever going to be a challenge to them? There's no way to raise the standard because you do the same thing they do except that you're a Christian. Makes no difference. You're a Christian sinner, they are a non-Christian sinner. That's all. You're a blood-washed sinner, but they are stained blood sinners. Both of you are sinners. But if you want to make a difference, you must rise above the spiritual vacuum. Each generation, in my generation, there was spiritual vacuum. I had to rise and make a difference. I had to put myself above. I have to lift myself above. And you can see all that is happening in your generation. And if you just succumb yourself to all that is taking place, you cannot make a difference. Out of the spiritual vacuum, if you rise and you prove God is real, that God is true, in the midst of all of that, then you become a generation that God will use. Amen. Then you can serve your generation well. Then you can become an answer. If you are plagued by all the sin, your generation is plagued. They are tempted, you are tempted, they, are, they, they fall under pressure, you fall under pressure. They have marital problems, you have marital problems. You know, and, and you are frustrated inside with all the things that you are doing, they are frustrated. You cannot be an answer. But if you rise above the spiritual vacuum and prove God is real in the midst of all of that, you rise and you show yourself strong in God. That through all, through our God, we have done valiantly. When we have proven that, then we can serve our generation well. So each generation is not going to be, God is not going to let you have everything free and easy. Every generation is getting harder and harder. Sin is no longer. If my grandfather was go, is going to go out to the prostitute, is it okay if I talk like this? All right. If my grandfather is going to go and meet the prostitute, he would have to cover his head at night and just walk down the dark alley. Is that right? Because he wants to see a naked woman. But today, it's, it's not, not the way it happens. You can turn on your computer and see it in your room. Sin is not in the streets anymore. It's in your house by a push of a button. You bring sin, fast forward sin, straight into your room. That's how dangerous you are living. In our days, they, it, a lot of danger is far away. But now danger, danger becomes your business. It becomes part of your life. The day, you, the, the day you turn on the computer, the day you turn on the radio, the day you turn on... Filth can come straight into your living room, straight into your own room, straight into the room that you use to pray and do your morning devotion. It can just flood in straight away. That's how dangerous it is. Are you listening? Yes. And you can see because of the reason this generation must rise above the vacuum and begin to push back the perversity, prove God is real, in spite of hell so close, yet we are strong. Yes. When that happens, you can serve your generation well. Are you listening? Yes. Each generation must rise out of the spiritual vacuum and prove God is real. You must rise above the spiritual vacuum. You cannot tell me, well, Papa, you don't understand. Pastor, you don't understand. You don't understand our generation. We understand. In our day, we had the same problem too, but in a different package. Sin is coming to you in a different package. Now it's wrapped differently. But sin came to us too. Sin came to Adam. Adam failed. Sin came to Cain. Cain failed. Sin came to Jesus. Jesus overcame it. Are you listening? But sin will come to anybody and everybody. But you have to come. You have to rise. It all came, comes in different packages. But you must know sin in whatever package is still called sin. Death, death in whatever package is called death. Poison in whatever color and form. If it's green color poison, blue color poison, is still poison. A yellow color poison is still poison. The packages may be different, but you must recognize that this is from the devil. No matter what name you call it, what alphabet you give it, what, what, super, what uh, scientific name you give it, it's still called poison. 
Are you listening? At the end of the day, you, you look at the, bo- at, the, at the edge of the bottle, it's written poison. Yeah. Even if you cannot pronounce a scientific name. Yeah. Is that true? It's written the poison. Keep it out of reach yeah. of children. Don't, don't take it through your mouth because that's poison. It's destructive. Whatever package it comes from. That's why our generations must rise above the spiritual vacuum. Yeah. No matter what happens, don't take it as an excuse. Don't say, well, you know, we are different. Our generation is different. We are under pressure. All of us have been under pressure. I was pre- under pressure in my generation. You will be under pressure in your generation. Your children will be under pressure in their generation. But they must rise. Are you listening? They must rise. Write down number three. Each generation is marked by, by the perversions of a reigning culture. Each generation is marked by the perversions of a reigning culture, R-E-I-G-N-I-N-G. That means a prevailing culture, perversions of a prevailing culture. Each generation is marked by the perversions of a prevailing culture or a reigning culture. And there is always a dominant thought pattern in it. There is always a dominant thought pattern in it. Each generation is marked by the perversions of a prevailing culture or reigning culture. And there is always a dominant thought pattern in it. Are you listening? Can I tell you what is in your generation? Yes. Can I warn you? Can I share with you what is in, you, in your culture? Yes. Your culture is plagued by entertaining self. Self-indulgence, self-entertainment, self-exaltation, self-assurance, self-preservation, self-promotion. Everything that has to do with self is the entertainment of self. Pleasure. In this generation, talk about spa, just spa alone. The pampering of the flesh. Oh, I'm telling you. The pampering of the flesh. The the exercise machines that have come out today. The bodies. You know, if we just talk about all kinds of cosmetic, you know, everything that has plagued our generation crazy is to project and promote self. And that's the prevailing thought pattern. Are you listening? That's the prevailing thought pattern. You have MTB. All the values are down. Self is promoter. Flesh is promoter. Are you hearing me? Yes. And this is, this, this is why there, there's so much titles because it's a projection of self-accomplishment. Yeah. That's why people are into titles. CEO, CEO of that left division and right division. And you have this name, that official, this superintendent. And they have so many names for positions. In those days, everybody was called some, as, as, a, as an officer. That's about all. Now you have CFO, CEO. Are you listening? You have so many executive officers for this division, that division, that division. In, in the past, we didn't have so many titles. Now people need that. It's a projection of self, projection of their attainment. Certificates, there's been no end to certificates. You either study or you buy. You can buy them too. You can even buy them from America and Canada, not just from India and Russia. You can buy them from America too. Are you listening? It's not only the third world countries that sell it, but even the first world countries do sell it too. Degrees. Many of them die by degrees too. All right, it's important for you and I to remember this this is a prevailing thought pattern, self. Everything that you see is a projection of self, pampering of self, the exaltation of self. That's the plague of this generation. And if if we can rise above it and destroy it and push it down and begin to put Christ instead of self. Kingdom instead of self. Oh, you will win. 
That's why the first thing you want to think is about yourself, how to preserve yourself, how to preserve your, 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 your place, your position, preserve your, your, your achievement so that nobody will run it down. That's why there's a lot of survival mentality because they feel that, oh, don't push me down, don't press me down. I'm a youth, I'm rising, and there are many souls that are trying to keep me down. It's called self-preservation. You are afraid that what you have will be lost. And this generation is in, plagued by this fear all right, of what they have achieved as self. You must, not, you must learn to trust God. Yes. Tonight I'm going to show you what the issues of trust, the areas of trust, how to, how to really put your trust in God, how to really put your trust in the kingdom, how to really put your trust in the word of God. I'm going to show you how to do that because the day you know how to lock in, it's over. It's over. The, all you need to do after you lock in is just press the button. The missile will just look for it. It's called guided missile. Are you listening? You must be able to lock in. You, once you put your faith and your trust in God, in all that God is wanting you to do, you lock in. That's, nobody can shake you. You're unshakable. Amen. You're convinced. I'm yeah. persuaded yes. that all that I've surrendered to God will not be lost. Yeah. You'll be so sure, so clear in your own heart. You cannot be shaken. No matter what happens, you cannot be shaken because your trust is locked in yes. into God. That's why as a young person, even though you have not seen the future, you don't have everything yet, you have God. In your God, you shall do valiantly. By faith, you can trust God. And all the people in the Bible, in, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, they trusted God. They locked their faith in God. And all things work out well for them. In the same way, it will happen for us. Amen. Amen. That's why each generation is marked by the perversions of a ruling, reigning culture, prevailing culture. And there's always a thought pattern behind it. There's always a thought pattern. They offer this to you, but there's a thought pattern. The thought pattern is always self. Self must not be reduced. Self must be exalted. People take a job that gives them a better self-image. Even though the pay is less. Are you listening? It's prestige. Where, where are you working? In that building. Wow, that building. All are executives. Even if you are just an office boy in that building, you feel like, let me take the job. Are you listening? It's all about self-image. They, they give a proper nice dressing to a person who is just working as a laborer. Give them nice uniform. It's all about image. When they come out, all of them look the same. They're working in Motorola. But they're not getting the same pay as the executives. A lot of things about, is about image. You know, they buy things for image sake. I mean, sometimes I watch how people come to our conferences they have never used tablets before. <laughs> Trying to learn how to use tablet in GLS. <laughs> GLS is Ferrari, man. G GLS is Formula One race. You don't use that. If you're learning to take, use your camera, don't take, take it to the for Formula One races. Because by the time you get ready to adjust, the car is gone. You snap, it's just a lane. <laughs> it's just the dust. Is that true? Yes. You're just learning. Where, where is the, where is, are you adjusting your bifocal? <laughs> the car is gone. Shh, it's gone. All you hear is sound, if you can capture sound. Are you listening? But that's not the place. You can see how it's, 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 people don't think carefully because that's the place. It's, it's all about image. If you buy a 42-inch TV, you have, you have a car parked out in a garage, a convertible. It's all about image. Whether you own it or you are renting it, nobody cares. It's just about image. You drive a car, I must drive a car. And young people, when they start things, it's about image. Brands. It's about image. It's a promotion of self. It's not a promotion of the brand. It's the, the, you're not supporting the company, you're supporting yourself. The brand is to increase your emo. Your, your, your image that is damaged. Yeah. 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 Are you listening? Yes. Levi. Whether it's Levi or XYZ, does not matter. It's still, it's still comfortable. That's what we want. Our older generation, as long as it's comfortable, as long as you can stretch, as long as you can do that, that's the old generation. We, we, we don't bother. As long as we can use it and it's applicable. For the young generation, they are damaged in their image. That's why everything needs to be a brand. 
If you train your children like that, it's because they don't know who they are. Are you listening? If you know who you are, anything does not matter. You just want to fulfill the plan and purposes of God. You, in, you minimize every kind of expenses. But the prevailing thought pattern of our generation is self. That's why everything people want it to, to be about image. Look at that amount of hair saloons, amount of spas, amount of exercise machine, and now amount of places where they offer pampering for pedicure, manicure, pedicure, manicure, what other cure? I don't know, all the, all the cures, whatever, whatever sickness you have. Why is it called a pedicure? Because you need to be cured. You have something is wrong somewhere. You're sick at some point. They call manicure. You need a cure for something. Something is wrong somewhere. It's true. And you'd be surprised how much we do it for the self becomes the, the center. It becomes the God of our generation. That's why it's very hard to get young people to really obey scriptures because everything is of what do I gain? What do I get? Where do I go? Every connection is how to go up higher. If they meet somebody, it's not by casual reason. They always have a plan, a strategy to take this thing up to the next level. They say hi to the girl is they want to date them. They want to date them. They want to have sex with them. There's always this kind of thing. It's always about the cell driving its force. But if you put cell to an end, then people can trust you. You put self to an end, people can trust you. Nobody can trust you if you have self and you engineering self every direction here, there, all over the place. Self is driving, it's on the driver's seat. Are you listening? But if you put self down in you, Christ lives within you. You know, you, you'll be a joy to have, a joy to talk to, a joy to relate, a joy to embrace. Because it's no longer you that liveth, but Christ that liveth within you. Can you say amen to that? Are you learning? Number four, each generation must prepare the way for the next generation. Each generation must prepare the way for the next generation. If you are an elder brother, you must prepare the way for your younger brothers. You must think like this all the time, every time. Each generation must prepare the way for the next generation. That's why I don't fight my generation. I have nothing to compete. I have friends, I have colleagues, I have those who are my contemporaries. If they have a problem with me, I have no problem. Because I'm not trying to reach out to them. Because we, all, we are running the race at their level, they are running the race. I want to open the door for the next generation. If my generation don't want, then I open the door for the next generation. So if you cannot serve your generation well, then open the door for the next ones to enter. Are we listening? Sometimes we say, oh, I'm trying to reach the older generation. Sometimes the older generation don't want you to reach them. So you reach out to the next one, the younger ones, the, the next generation. Reach, open the door for them. Hey, it's true. If you have brothers and sisters in your, in your family, they don't want to touch their children, touch your nephew, touch your niece. Get them in, get them in, get them in. Because once they are in, your brother and sister will come. We spend all our time trying to reach our brother, our sister, and, and forget about the children. You'd be surprised. Reach their children. Yeah. Open the door for the next generation. Speak to the next generation. Let them enter in. Let them come in by droves. And then you see your brother and sister will all walk in. Yeah. Why? Because when their children have been touched by God, they will listen to them. Yeah. That's why many of our families don't get saved. Because we're waiting for our brother, our sister to get saved. Touch, their, touch your nephew. Take your nephew to kindergarten. Take your nephew to church. Take your nephew to give the nephew a Bible and begin to touch them, reach out to them and change their life and transform. Let them become so hooked to the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom things. What's going to happen is slowly they will influence their family from within. Every day as they look at their children, see their children change, your brother's heart will change. Your sister's heart will change. Are you listening? Or else, or else you become discouraged. Oh, they don't want to serve God and I, I've, I've lost no matter what I try. They will never be saved. They will be saved. It's called the change of strategy. Are you listening? Each generation must prepare the way for the next. Amen? Aquila and Priscilla begin to prepare Apollos. Is that right? Aquila and Priscilla, because they already touched God and touched Paul and understood Paul, begin to prepare Apollos so that Apollos can interpret the scripture more accurately so that he can enter. Are you listening? Yeah. 
That's what I look. That's why we do the youth congress. Because we want your generation. I do GLS. I do training of the Isaac pastors and leaders at that level. But we need to reach the younger generation. Maybe one day we will reach out for the youth, the little children, maybe three years old, all the way down to 12 years old. Just get them, touch them. You'd be surprised if they spend one week with me. What will happen to these little children? I can only imagine what can happen. If we can find a way how to bring all these little children together, you know, from five years old to 12 years old and put them all together and just bring Jesus and God into their lives and bring them into the presence of God, oh, it will be a story to tell. And start them younger. Give them another 25 years and you know what's going to happen? They're going to become the cream of our society. Because right from the young, they have been put on closer and closer to God. Bring God down to them. That's why sometimes for those of you who are youth, go back. Go back to your churches. What do you do? Just plan to get all the children from three, four years old, five years old, babysit them for that weekend and bring Jesus. Teach them how to worship. Teach them how to pray. Teach them how to receive the Holy Ghost. Teach them how to see vision. And just, just do that. Your whole church will change. You don't have to wait for somebody to come from America. You have enough to change them first. They will listen to you better and faster because you are the uncle. You are the brother. You are somebody older they look up to. One day when they get older, what's going to happen? They're going to come to the youth world. And some of them will want to come up from Sunday school immediately. And they want to follow the older ones. Hey, I think we should not stop them. I think we should not stop them. Those of them who are good enough, who can leave Sunday school and come straight into the youth world, we should let them come in. But by privilege only. By choice only. They must prove their worth so that they can walk among the best. Are you listening? In the same way, we take the youth up to the next level so that they can work with the adults. We qualify each one of them. The Sunday school, the youth work, the adult work must all be connected together under the same strategy. Because that's what education does. Primary school, secondary school, upper secondary, lower, se lower secondary, upper secondary, then we go to university. Is that right? But it's a straight line. But sometimes our Sunday school is not connected to the youth work. Youth work is not connected to adult work. And the youth work was by its own. Sunday school is by its own. So everything is not coordinated. And the Sunday school teachers try to keep the Sunday school children in the Sunday school as long as possible, even after they are 25. <laughs> are you listening? Because it's the Sunday school teacher's little kingdom. She is Queen Mary, Victoria, four, five, whatever it is. And youth work is also the same. They say, don't go to the adult. The adult don't understand. Let's, let's just stay. So the youth work will just circle until they all drop off and backslide. No, we, we are not, we're dis, not segregated. We're all connected. Are you listening? Right on number five. Each generation must secure the next generation's destiny. Each generation must secure the next generation's destiny by their present obedience, each generation must secure the next generation's destiny by their present obedience. Each generation must secure the next generation's destiny by their present obedience. If I am careless, the next generation have nothing to receive. If I work hard, the next generation will have a head start. Yes. Is that right? Yes. They enter in on my expense. Yes. I can buy the tickets for them. Yes. Are you listening? Yes. They may not have the money, but I can buy the tickets for them. And they can enter in on account of me. Yes. And that's what you and I must think. Each generation must secure the next generation destiny by our present obedience. Sometimes it's not just about you. When you obey God, it's not just about you being blessed, but you're also opening up the pathway of blessing for the next generation because you labor, you work hard, even as I do. I write the books, I do the CDs, I do the studies, I do the tapes. All that becomes tools and materials for the next generation. Next generation doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. They can take what we have and go to the next level. They can learn what we have and go to the next level. The, the musicians have been trained here. They, our young generation can just... Learn from them and become better and better. We can pick up the skills. We can pick up the talents. We can pick up whatever that they have. 
What they have built into their life can become ours by virtue of connection. Can you say amen to that? Let me give you six and seven and then we're going to pray. And then when we come back after the break, we just want to ask the Holy Spirit to show us Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Manasseh, and the generations to come. Amen. And, and I'm telling you, it will shock you because there is a proper way of connecting and there's a wrong way of connecting. If you connect wrongly, then the blessings don't flow. But if you connect rightly, it flows without you asking. There are blessings you don't pray for. The Lord command the blessings. That's why you will come to a point in your life that you will never have to have care, anxiety, worry about your future. Because the Lord will command the blessing. And you must remove this stress because you know when you're connected, there is no reason why it should not flow. If you're connected well, they have supply, you have demand. The moment there is demand, you will flow. The water will flow from the high level to the low level. From one generation to the next generation. The ones that are up higher and you're connected to them, it will automatically flow into your life. That's why what flows into me will flow into Joanne, will flow in, from Joanne into Zara, and from Zara into her children. It is automatic. I'm telling you, it's automatic. Why is it automatic? Because the system is set up. If the system is not set up, then it's a struggle. Then you have to take a little bit, take a little bit, take a little bit. But if the system is settled, it's not a problem. This is a television. The television is connected to the aerial. The aerial is connected in, in frequency to the broadcasting station. So everything is in, the system is set. So your remote control controls the TV and controls the channel. If, so if you press channel one, what, what would you get? Channel one. If there's a live telecast in channel two, you press channel two, will you get live telecast? Yes. Is that automatic? Yes. Talk to me, is that automatic? Yes. Do you have to struggle, hit your TV, kick your remote, and, and get up to then shake your area? If you have to do that, it's because the system is not properly set up. Are you listening? You, 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 just, you just sit down and on the couch and you use your fingers. That's all you do. Just use fingers at your fingertips. Is that true? You get everything that's happening in the broadcasting station 200 miles away, 500 miles away, sometimes thousands of miles away, you can watch the Olympics live at a fingertip. And then you tell me spiritual technology is poorer than that? Talk to me. You think spiritual technology is weaker than that? No, it's better than that. In a twinkling of an eye, the Bible says a man can be transformed. Hey, you understand technology. If, if in natural technology is so powerful, think what spiritual technology is all about. God spoke the word. He created the whole world just by speaking. Are you listening? He said, let, let there be healing. There was healing. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, the spirit of Lazarus from paradise came into straight back. Into, into his body, yes. just in the twinkling of an eye. Yes. You believe that? Yes. That's why the more you see technology, the more you must believe God can do it faster, better. Yes. Are you listening? Yes. He can do it. Yes. He can make it happen. It's doable. Yes. That's why our generation, there is hope, there is future, because you understand the processes of how things happen. Don't have, don't have to try to psycho ourselves and become frightened. That's why I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of youth. I'm not afraid of all the ideas you have. I'm not afraid about whatever you say. I say, well, not a problem. You want to change the world? Not a problem. You want to create this and you want to go to the moon and build houses in the moon? Not a problem. We can help you build the processes right so that your dreams can become a reality. If it is God, then it will work. If it is not God, at the end of the day, when you work out all the processes, at least you found out it's not God. Rather than we stop you and forever thinking it may be God, but my father stopped me. It could have been, I could have been successful if he didn't stop me. At least you can be sure that you didn't hear right. Then at least you can say, what is right then? If this is wrong, then what is right? We're not going to stop you because we are not afraid of you. We're not afraid of youth having big dreams because we have big dreams ourselves. But we just want to make sure that your heart is clear in, inside you you must know that we must secure for the next generation. Our obedience is not just for ourselves. Are we listening? Let me show you a verse of scripture. 
to show you how powerful your personal obedience is. Say personal obedience. Personal obedience. Partial obedience, partial obedience. Partial disobedience. is disobedience. The book of John chapter 4. Let's see the power of personal obedience. Is this what I mean? In verse 30, 34. Have we got it? Yes. All the way down to verse 38. Your personal obedience creates a cycle. Are you listening? Yeah. Your personal obedience creates a cycle. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. So what is our food? To pray. To pray the will of God who sent me. To pray about the will of God or to do. To do. A lot of people talk about it, pray about it, discuss it. Com compare it. Hope to get some confirmations on it. But they don't do. But it's in doing there is life. Are you listening? Yes. Yes. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Yes. Are you listening? Yes. Can I show you something here? Yes. All right. Let's say God wants me to give a thousand ringgits to the building fund. Why are you quiet? <laughs> are you ready? Yes. He wants me to give a thousand ringgits to the building fund. Yes. The moment he says, a thousand ringgits. Every fear that I have will manifest. If God didn't speak, I act like I'm good. I'm righteous. I love the Lord. Is that true? You're good until God speaks. Then you find out how good you are. Then your fear. A thousand ringgits. Why can't God say a hundred? A thousand. A thousand is a lot. Then you suddenly become a mathematician. <laughs> Not a Christian anymore, but a mathematician. <laughs> suddenly you begin to fear. Then suddenly you begin to think of your expenses. Suddenly you begin to, now, now you are a planner. Are you with me? Now, now you're a serious business entrepreneur, business planner. You are now a banking officer. You're counting your money. You're counting your gold. You're, counting, you're thinking of how much you have. Now, all of a sudden, all because God spoke to you. That's why the Bible says, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish a work. By obeying the, giving that thousand ringgits, there is a work that will be done in my heart. Yes. That work is incomplete until I obey that God to give the thousand. Because my fear of tomorrow is still there. My fear of lack is still there. My fear of not having enough to do what I want to do is still there. My fear that God don't understand is still there. So that work must be accomplished. But in doing what you need to do, there is a work only God can do inside your heart. But the thousand ringgits is easy to give. When you do, God will do. There is a work that must be accomplished, but there must be a will that you must do. You do, that thousand ringgit goes into the offering bank with joy, with excitement, that whatever work area that is incomplete in you, God will do it. You'll be very surprised. All God has to do is just say one word, and all of a sudden, everything that is not right inside you that can be shaken will be shaken. All of a sudden, all these areas become exposed. God said, next, I want you to go for EYC. EYC, that's in Switzerland. What are, what are they going to eat? Where will I stay? Maybe I may not like the food. How many people stay in one room? I've never stayed with others before. Who is coming? Who is coming from my church? I, I don't want to go alone. Oh, if people, if somebody, if God wants me to go, then he must bring other people who are in the same church. He must touch every, you can see your misbehavior by just God saying one word. You can see your whole world being shaken. You'll be surprised. You thought you are hell of a good. 
until hell and all the goods begin to manifest. <laughs> and you'd be thinking, what kind of a person am I? After God speaks one word, all of a sudden, all your lacks show up. <laughs> within a moment of time. Just within a moment of time. And God begins to speak to you, I want you to go and give that 50 euros to that person. In the youth conference. And that, that's the last 50 euro you have. And you'll be thinking, Lord, this is daylight robbery. <laughs> you know I have 50. You know I'm going to go to the club today. You know there is not enough this. You know that I wanted to buy this for Sally and Molly and Auntie, Auntie Kelly in back at home. This 50, that's all I have. But you know all of that and you are targeting this 50. You'd be surprised what your mind is capable of doing and thinking. You will be shocked. You know, you look holy and righteous in lifting a Lord, I love you with all my heart, soul, and my strength, and my mind, and everything within me. Bless your holy name until God speaks the word. Then all of a sudden, the turmoil is that. Don't you care for us? We are perishing. Are you listening? That's why the Bible says, my meat is the will of, do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So there is a work that is incomplete in our life. That work cannot be done except by obedience. When we obey, then something happens. Yes. Listening, all the areas of your heart that is, that's, that's why God put pressure on us. To let us know there are a lot of other areas of crack. That if you don't meet the requirement of God at that moment of time, all those areas will not be touched. Are you listening? Yes. Now, how many of you paint before? Paint. All right. So you want to paint this building. You go into this room four, room number four, and start wanting to paint. And all of a sudden, as you're wanting to paint, you realize the old paint is coming out. So what must you do? You cannot paint. You have to scrape it. All right, just say yes, because I know, I know you don't paint. I can see with your response. I know some of you never held a brush before. <laughs> then you will have to scrape it. And if you start to scrape it, the place becomes dirty, yeah. become dusty. Yeah. And the way you, 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 you have to use, use all the things that is needed and the cleaning and everything else, you have to make sure that all the other works must be done also. You've got to clean up the place. You've got to remove the dust. You've got to make sure... You got to scrape all of that. But if you didn't go in pain, you didn't realize what kind of extra other work that needs to be done. Are you listening? In the same way, when God didn't speak to us, you do not know what is lacking in our lives. So God is merciful. He speaks to us every day to show all the areas that will begin to manifest and show up. Are we hearing? All the other areas will show up because by God speaking, He will shake everything that can be shaken. And what remains is the kingdom. So he wants to make sure the kingdom is established in this manner. Is that right? Yes. Talk to me. Is that right? Yes. And do not say there are yet four months and then come harvest. Harvest is, they are already white for harvest. That means to say what is ahead four months in time, you will come forward. So you obey. God reveal all the lacks. And God completes what is lacking in your life. What's happened? The job is done. Is that right? You have done something. God has done something, your partner's in it. You did what you, you can do. What can you do? A thousand ringgits into the offering box. That's what you can do. What you cannot do is remove the fear of tomorrow. What you cannot do is remove the fear of lack. That's always hiding inside your heart. But that's the work he will accomplish. So you do, he finished a work. That means the work of God is done. What must we do that we might do the works of God? Believe. Amen. The moment we believe and obey what God asks us to do, so the work that you cannot do, because you don't know it's there. You obey what you know, God does what you cannot do. So when that is done, the work is finished. So when do we pay people? When they finish the work. You hire a painter, the painter has finished all the painting, what would he give to you? He give to you the bill, you just pay him. You cannot just say, well, I won't pay. No, you can't. Because you have to pay when the work is done. 
So when the work is accomplished and you have done God's will, what happened? You cannot wait for four months. And then come harvest. Harvest must come now because the work is finished. The person needs to be paid for immediately. So God is kind to us when the work is complete. So what was supposed to come four months ahead of time comes four months forward. You quicken, you bring forward your future into the now. How many want to have, make that happen in your life? Do, do you want to make that happen in your life? So that things that needs to come to you, come to you because you obey God and you serve God. You do what God wants you to do. God does what He can do. And together the work is finished and complete in your life. When the work is complete and you become God's workmanship and the job is complete, all that needs to come to you will come to you. Four months. Nobody can stop it. So you cannot say there are four months and then come harvest. Harvest is already here. Are you listening? Not only is harvest here, the Bible tells us what? Let's, let's read further because it will be interesting for us to know. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that he who sows and reap may rejoice together. So what happens is this, a process continues. Are you listening? A process continues. The Bible says you receive wages, you receive reward, you receive everything else. Sometimes, you know, the person does a, such a good job, you give him extra. Is that true? A, pers a person does a good job and he does so well and you're so pleased with it. He said, never mind, take the extra $50. Don't need to give me the return. Please, it's okay. God bless you. Just go ahead. Is that right? Yes. That's what the Bible talks about. Wages, which is your due. Rewards, which is above and over. Isn't God good? Yes. So when you obey, you can see you're opening up all these things for yourself. Yeah. Are you listening? And the Bible tells us those who, those who sow and those who reap, they will rejoice together. They have also their own rewards. The one who spoke, spoke to you will have his reward. The one who obeys will have the reward. As a preacher, I will have the reward. As, as an obedient people, you will have your reward. So you will rejoice, I will rejoice. I get my share, you will get your share of blessing from the same God. Are you listening? You will receive the same blessing. The Bible tells us that also, that for in this case... One sows and another reaps. I also send you to reap where you have not labored. Others have labored and you will enter into their labor. Sometimes what happens is this, as you start to obey, all right, as you start to obey, God allows you to tap into the grace of others. Are you listening? Other people have labored and they have become financially strong. They are now financially very capable because they have already lived this way before. Are you listening? Because of the obedience, they have accumulated wealth. Because of the obedience, God has given them power to make wealth. So they are, they are the ones ministering to you. So what happens when you obey, not only your work is accomplished, but you also enter into their labor. Whatever they are laboring and what they have built and whatever they have grown and acquired and, and, and gathered in themselves, you enter into their labor. You look, before, before EYC, I worked hard. As I always do. I worked hard. I prepared the notes. I prepared all that was needed. In fact, I wanted to put the thing materials into your hands so that you will have it for a long period of time, which will still come to you at some point before the year is over. I think you can say thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. All right. It's, it's important. It will still come to you at some point so that all the things we talked about, our devotion to God and all this aspect, you can have it as, as personal files for yourself so that you always will remember. You have taken down notes, but also other notes will come to you. So that as young people, you don't have to gather on things on your own. These things can be given to you. So I have labored. You enter into my labor. So you enter into what you have not labored. But somebody else has labored. But because of the connection of generation, what I have labored, you can enter in. So whatever I have sown, the tears I've sown, the sacrifice I've made, the things that I've done, the research that I've done, the gathering that I've done, the communication that I had with God, and the words that He spoke to me, all of that package, you have access to it. Yes. And you get the benefit from it. Isn't it amazing? Yes. That's what happens when each generation is responding to God well, this is what will happen. Amen? You believe that? Yes. Talk to me, do you believe that? Yes. Afterwards, after the break, when we come back, I want to show you how Abraham's blessing will come upon Isaac, how Isaac's blessing will come upon Jacob, Jacob's blessing will come upon Joseph, and Joseph's blessing will begin to come on Manasseh. Are you listening? Yes. When the blessing generationals become connected, it flows in an automatic way. 
And each one of them must qualify to qualify that level of connection. They have to connect. If you connect casually, there'll be short circuit. Like if you put the plug point into, into, the, into the socket, and it's, it's all the while shaking, 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 what's going to happen? It will create shorts, short circuits. And short circuits can create problem for the whole house. But if you connect well, if you switch on, what happens? You get proper supply. There is no interference whatsoever. That's why we have to qualify our connections. And when we qualify the connections and connect at the right places, what's going to happen? It becomes an automatic flow. If I'm in Malaysia and you are connected, what's going to happen? What I touch will flow to you. It's only a matter of time. You believe that? Yes. All you got to do is switch on, press your remote, channel one, you get the broadcast. Yeah. Straight in. It's amazing. It is this technology that people hate. It's this technology the institutional church don't have. That's why what they receive is lost in one generation. But what we receive cannot be lost in our generation. We must make way for the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, so that every generation becomes better and better and better. Can you say amen to that? Yeah. Hey, in, those, in those days, in 1948, we start the car like this. <laughs> now, you press the remote and adjust the air condition. You start the car from the outside. Change the temperature, cool or hot, whatever you want, and, and the music, everything is on, lights all on, the seats all adjusted, everything, the engine is warm, just for you to just get inside, that's all. Are you listening? Yeah. Like, there will come a day that you will not have to drive, just sit inside, yeah. autopilot. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I, I'm not joking. Yeah. If you think I'm joking, it's because you're a joke, you're not living in this world. We've been living on planet Earth. If you know the progress is like that. It's a matter of time. Yeah. It's a matter of time that people don't drive anymore. So it's protect them from all the accidents. Because accident is destroying people's lives. Yeah. Killing people's lives. So the cars will be built in such a way that you'll be mandatory for you to drive cars like that. You cannot have your own car that you can do whatever you want. And you won't be driving anymore. So... All of it could be systemized in such a way that all the cars are interrelated in some measure, some form. The connections of electronics will be able to identify your car is coming at what speed, at what angle, and how my car must behave to your car and how your car must behave. Maybe I will have power to reduce your speed from my car. So that... Yeah, I don't know. I'm just thinking aloud. It must be the sausage I ate. But. It's, it's important for us to know each generation is going to get better and better. That's why I don't expect you to go down. I expect you to go up. I expect you to become better and better, stronger and stronger. Rise to your feet. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that there will be a new generation that will rise in a powerful way. A generation that will serve you with all the ounce of energy, strength, talents, gifts and graces that you've given to them. So that in the days ahead, they will be able to do and accomplish great things for you. Lord, I pray that this generation will begin to see it's possible. It's doable. It is doable. It can happen. Nothing is impossible. We can make it happen. In our generation, in our lifetime, men can call upon the name of the Lord. People from other churches can look at what God is doing in our church and begin to see that something supernatural is taking place. The generations are connected. There is an automatic flow of God's blessing and how the blessings of God can abound powerfully. I pray from this moment henceforth, put hope in our hearts. Put hope in our hearts that the, the churches in Europe can begin to rise up. Put hope in our hearts so that all that you desire to do in our lives will be done. So that we see things happen in our generation that we others have never seen before. That people can say how glorious are the works of God. How powerful are the handiworks of heaven. I pray, Father, that faith will arise in our hearts and we will yield ourselves completely to you in total obedience because our obedience will pave the way for the next generation. We thank you, we honor you for each generation. Thank you for the fathers, for the mothers, for the sons, for the daughters, for the grandchildren and for the next generation beyond that. That what you began in one, you'll continue in the other and you magnify your work from generation to generation. You are the God of the generations. We thank you. You're the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Joseph, 
and the God of the tribes of Israel. We thank you, Lord, that you're a God of all. Hallelujah. We bless you. We honor you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Amen. 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 We receive grace. Receive grace. We receive grace from you, Lord. We receive supernatural grace from you to live in our generation and time. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated.